open with um, with purpose and taking action to build some structural equity and inclusion, which is what we're striving to do and what our team has done exceptionally well. I know this is the first time that we're participating in um, open access week programming, but it's not the first time that we've been engaged with open access. Uh, I think we've been a model for um, the SUNY system. I know when I've asked questions, I'm always referred back to um, Oneonta for an example, which I think is, is a source of pride. Um, just so that you have a sense of um, recap, I know you have a sense of some of the things that um, the campus has done and our team has done um, since last year, we have a new open access policy. We are stakeholders in the SUNY open access repository, and we have two very skilled individuals that are participating on that. And we have a thriving open educational resource initiative uh, that's lowering the barriers and costs for our SUNY Oneonta students. And I'm exceptionally proud of all of that and proud of the team that we have putting this together to, to ensure that we have um, that our students have access to all of our learning materials. And, and I want to thank everyone for doing that and for being part of that. And, and with that, I'll turn it back to the panel because I'm looking forward to hear the, uh, the panel discussion. Thank you, Provost Kahanov. I'm Darren Chase and the Library Director and Interim Director of TLTC. And I, I want to thank the Faculty Center, TLTC and the Library for their hard work and putting this panel together. And I'll say a few words uh, before we move to the panel discussion and reflecting on our International Open Access Week theme of open with purpose, taking action to build structural equity and inclusion. I recognize how gracefully our campus mission passes through the lens of open access. Open access is a framework that seeks the free, immediate online availability of research articles coupled with the rights to use these articles fully in the digital environment. The intention of open access is to make and research widely available. In our mission, our campus mission, we state that we nurture a community where students grow intellectually, thrive socially, and live purposefully. Our practices as adopted by our campus open access policy and open structures like the SUNY open access repository nourish learning and scholarly communities, foster intellectual growth and model purpose driven social engagement by deliberately replacing walls with bridges by removing paywalls, high costs and other barriers to research and scholarship while implementing and sustaining initiatives and resources that connect students, faculty, researchers, and practitioners with educational resources, research, and scholarship. Let's consider again what we've accomplished and how much we have to celebrate this Open Access Week. The new campus open access policy that establishes a structure making Oneonta faculty peer-reviewed research articles available. We have a stake in the SUNY Open Access Repository, which officially launches this week, where Oneonta authors can openly share their scholarly and creative works. And we have a thriving open educational resource resources initiative that lowers barriers and costs for SUNY Oneonta students. I'll be placing links to all of these in our chat so that you can review them and hopefully take away from the panel the um, pathways to these great resources. And this is why I'm so excited about today's panel discussion. I'd like to introduce our moderators now. Ed Beck is a SUNY Oneonta instructional designer in our Teaching, Learning, and Technology Center and co-lead of our campus OER initiative, really the spearhead of this initiative, which is recognized as a model of excellence throughout the SUNY system. And Jennifer Jensen is the SUNY Oneonta Scholarly Communications Librarian and co-lead of our campus OER initiative and the campus lead administrator of the SUNY Open Access Repository. So with that, I turn it over to our moderators. Thank you. So we introduce the theme of this week's Open Access Week, International Open Access Week, was open with a purpose. And I think the, the theme here is really challenging us to think beyond 
just cost of reasons for why we why we're involved in this open community in this open ecosystem. We're asking ourselves questions like who else can we invite in the conversations? What viewpoints that have been traditionally marginalized can we invite into the conversation? How can we instantly share cutting edge research around the globe and even on a micro level? Because we we, we exist on a micro level at the classroom level. What do we hope for our students? And for our experiences and we have these three panelists that we're going to invite and each of them comes into this open conversation from a little bit of a different angle we have people who are doing open scholarship and sharing that with everyone we have people that are doing open textbooks and creating high quality resources and we have people who are bringing students into the creation process of these open um, initiatives and having them build and be part of that uh, process. So each each panelist brings something different here and we're very excited for them. Um, we're going to let each panelist give an overview of their projects and then we're going to invite individual questions. Um, questions can be put right in the chat and uh, either Jen or I can bring that to the attention of the panelists. So we're so proud to have our panelists today, Dr. Greg Fulkerson, Catherine Kilachowski, um, Dr. Kristen Rosa, and Dr. Nicole Wade. Uh, I'm going to provide further introductions before each panelist speaks, so let's get started with our first speakers, um, Greg and Catherine. Um, Greg Fulkerson is professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at SUNY Oneonta. He teaches courses on population, environment, and social change, along with core methods and analysis courses. He has served on the Open Access Journal of World Systems Research, and he helped establish the Open Access Student Journal, SOAR, as a faculty advisor. And Catherine Kilachowski graduated from SUNY Oneonta in 2018 with a bachelor's in sociology and a BS in political science, while a student SUNY Oneonta, Catherine helped found the SOAR Student Journal, where she subsequently served on the editorial board in several roles over um, five semesters. So if Greg and Catherine, over the next few minutes, you could tell us about SOAR. Is, is Catherine here? I want to just make sure. I don't, I'm not sure I saw her in the attendee list. I know she had a work meeting today. She did. She had a meeting right yeah. before she was to join us as soon as she could. So hopefully she'll jump in. OK, yeah, I was I was worried. <laughs> OK, well, I will uh, I'll start us off and hopefully she'll join us. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, Jennifer, for setting this up and for inviting me uh, uh, to the library, to Darren, and everybody for putting this together. It's a great event and a good purpose, a good cause. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. I've got our. Uh, our website up, so I want to just say a little something about this project. Can you all see that? Yes, looks great. Yes. Oh, good. OK, so this is our academic journal, SOAR, SUNY Oneonta Academic Research. And this actually started uh, through a special topics course. I thought, you know, I really want to put students uh, in the process of what goes on sort of behind the scenes in terms of the academic uh, publication process, you know, kind of give them a different angle of what scholarship is. Um, a lot of times I, I teach methods courses, so I kind of share anecdotally my experiences as a peer reviewer or as an author. I thought, wouldn't it be great if we had a way for students to see the other side of academic research? And, uh, you know, they themselves may one day go into that world. And I thought it would actually help promote, you know, some interest in higher learning and so forth. So I you know, started this special topics and it didn't enroll a lot of students. Uh, I don't know how many people would sign up for a course called Social Science Journal, <laughs> but we had a handful. <laughs> but it was a good selection effect because the ones who signed up were extremely committed to academics and were very interested and in the idea of a student run journal. So day one of the special topics course, I said the reason you're here is up to you. You know, we're going to be putting together a journal. I don't want it to be a faculty led initiative. I want it to from day one be a student initiative. Uh, so that's from the naming of the journal to the choice to become open access to 
the design. The logo is actually designed by a student on campus uh, in graphic design. So this uh, really has been everything about this has been carefully considered and discussed through countless meetings. Uh, you know, when the course ended, every single person involved in the in that special topics course said, I want to stay involved. And we said, oh, you know, I'm not sure this needs to be a course. So it became more of like an e-board style, uh, not an academic club, uh, but run similarly. So we've been involving students who aren't necessarily signing up for anything. Some of them are signing up as assist uh, research assistants uh, because it's there are a few things more related to the research process <laughs> than working with an academic journal. And uh, you know, in terms of the choice of open access, uh, it really we did have some conversations, you know, about you know should this be a subscription-based journals? What do we gain from that? And very quickly, we realized that you know after sharing our experiences and my own experiences, having taught courses like research methods where students do literature reviews, I said how concerned I was, you know, that I had students actually tell me that they had purchased articles you know for the research you know like they're doing a literature review they googled something they found an article and they paid 35 dollars out of their you know credit card or whatever to buy an article and i said why did you do that <laughs> please never do that so now i make it a point whenever i teach the class you know please never you know get the credit card out and pay for one of these articles we can probably find it for you through the library but just you know the it creates a disruption. It, you know, there's a discon discontinuity in the research process that rears its head as a result of these paywalls and so forth. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I I shared my experiences, and you know, the other one, you know, having served on a journal, uh, the Journal of World Systems Research is open access, and knowing that 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 journal was committed to being available to people in less developed countries because it's fundamental to the world systems. Uh, analysis uh, sub community of scholars. It's a multidisciplinary social science journal, but they are committed to ensuring that people in less developed countries who didn't have the resources, you know, thirty five dollars, maybe something that a relatively privileged college student could afford to pay. And most most college students aren't in a position to do that. I mean, that's a that's a textbook more than an article. We wanted to make sure that individuals could access the research without having to you know, find these you know, exorbitant resources. And uh, so the the decision was made. We're going to be open access. We want everybody to be able to see the sword journal, especially students. All the all the research on this journal, uh, all the editorial board has been students from day one. Uh, I've served as a faculty advisor. But when it comes to the peer review process, that too has been conducted entirely by students. We have a, a process where we involve students in doing peer reviews. And you know, we encourage people who can participate in the board or as a peer reviewer to consider being an author and those kinds of things. So it's been a really great uh, way to involve students in research. And for most of them, you know, the way they're being socialized into this world as an open access journal will make that the norm. For them, you know, they will never have this experience of having to deal with, you know, at least as a, as a scholar themselves, having to deal with the reality of uh, publishers and so forth. Uh, the other thing is we've had full control over, you know, the, the website, uh, the, the process for how we review articles. Um, I've worked on uh, publisher operated journals as well. I won't mention them by name, but they have their own systems for how they review articles, for how they assign articles. They have these auto mechanized emails they send to people, and we didn't really want that. We wanted to put our own touch and we wanted it to be more of a personal touch and we wouldn't have that control if we were going through a mainstream publisher. You know, so even if we got the interest of one of the big uh, uh, for profit companies, we would have lost something of our soul in the process most likely uh, so i don't know if katie's come on if she wants to add anything if she's here i haven't seen her arrive yet i hope she does come and we can have her speak a little <laughs> yeah uh, so you know I, I was looking at 
you know, the, the talking points, and I, I think I hit most of them, but uh, yeah, the equity inclusion piece is so vital to this. Uh, like I said, not all of my students have the resources for one thing to to pay for the, the $35 article that they encounter because a lot of them do Google for research instead of using the library search engines, which point them to the, the resources they've already paid for through their student fees. Uh, and I've had students tell me that, you know, I found an interesting article, but I, I couldn't download it, you know, so I, I had to move on to other things and I say, well, why couldn't you download it? Well, I, I didn't have the money to buy that. And I said, well, you know, it's just, it just kind of breaks your heart. It's like, you know, like <laughs> you shouldn't have to face this. I mean, uh, like I said, I, now that I've, I've had a few of those experiences myself as a teacher, I know to say, OK, we're doing a literature review. Here's how you find an article. By the way, never pay for an article <laughs> if you can avoid it. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if you join a society, a lot of times they include membership and all those. Maybe that's a different exception, but overall, uh, most of our students are not going to join academic professional societies. And if they do, uh, it's usually like a, a student membership and they don't get access necessarily to the journal. So yeah, this has been front and center from a global perspective, um, you know, ensuring that people from less developed countries have access for one thing to published research, but also that our own students, you know, who don't necessarily have the resources, have access to everything they need to do good scholarship. Uh, I really love that the journal socializes our students into the world of open access, into the world of scholarship, and really just kind of makes them one of the same, you know, so that they're not they're not having to deal with the for profit model. Uh, if they go into academia, they will confront it at some point, but this will be the baseline that they compare it to, you know, so that's that's what I'm really proud of. Um, so I'd love to answer questions at the end, uh, but that's pretty much the story. Thank you, Greg. The abbreviated version. <laughs> it, this was several years in the making, but I'm very proud of it. So thank you. Thank you. I have some questions for the end, so we'll, okay. we'll wait to see what they have for the chat. And also, <laughs> I know that I've got plenty of questions to talk about. Great. Yeah, so um, thank you so much, Greg. And hopefully Catherine will join us when she's finished with her meeting, her previous yeah. meeting. Um, but our next panelist is Dr. Kristen Rosa. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at SUNY Oneonta. Her research interests include reproductive aging and toxicology in female mammals. For a course that she teaches about comparative anatomy of vertebrates, Dr. Rosa has worked with students and open pedagogical practices to create an OER book that she's going to describe for us today. So Kristen, if you don't mind. So I came at this from multiple directions. Um, I've been using OER in some of my courses. I teach a lot of specialized upper division courses where there's not a lot of um, OER available as compared to like introductory biology courses. Um, so I've been for a, a year now and I will in the spring use a uh, textbook from my histology course that's open access that um, came from Columbia Medical School that I've um, edited a bit for my purposes to go with the slide collection that we have here on campus. And also another open um, histology is microscopic view of tissue. Um, a, another open slide collection that's digital that students will be using for the spring since we're online, I guess. Um, so doing that project last two years ago has actually set me up pretty well to teach that class online because it's a online textbook and an online um, specimen repository. Uh, I've got this project here that I've been working on for three years now in collaboration with students. Um, I'll show you that in a moment. And then I've been coming off my sabbatical, published a few papers in open access journals, one similar to the one that Greg has described, an uh, undergraduate research journal, open access, that's run by the folks at SUNY Oswego actually. Um, a similar type of thing where my student co-author got to be 
corresponding author and do the submissions and go through the peer reviews and everything. So uh, my atlas here, I will share the screen. It's, so I teach comparative vertebrate anatomy. Kristen, is it possible to put your microphone slightly closer to your mouth? Maybe. It's a little quiet. Uh, I'm also having trouble getting. All right, can we see my screen now? Yes, we can. All right. OK, so. A book, so to speak, but not. Um, it's more of a digital resource that we've created here. Teaching um, an upper division comparative vertebrate anatomy course with um, student input into this open educational resource. I developed it because there is not a lot online for digital resources to use for this course. Um, so there was a, a hole in the resources available. And for our students, this hasn't been a particular issue, but I was thinking about access to the lab, um, particularly for non-traditional students, students with families and tough work schedules. Um, something like comparative anatomy requires them to come into the lab a lot and work with their specimens and study a lot. Um, so this was a way to provide resources online so students could study at home and not have to come into the lab. And it's become, it's really taken off in the last few months because it's the only resource out there that's well organized and put together. And so other institutions have found it and have started using it when they were locked out of their labs in the spring and in the fall and couldn't get in to hold in person labs. So this I'm going to show you some of the. This is in the chat if you want to look around a little bit. This was a student project um, for two years now where uh, one of the final projects the students did was create an atlas of a particular system. And they came out so beautiful that we just um, edited them a little bit and put them online. Um, so it's a equivalent of a book you'd pay lots of good money for and um, is a study resource for students to look at at home. So most of this stuff is student generated. All of these pages here have got different uh, I like to show the cat. That was one of my favorite ones early on. A couple students did this together um, and made it look really nice. Um, so I've had students submit these at the end of the semester. They work on um, getting them looking really nice for the website. And then so, so they're submitting the work. They know that it's going to be part of a resource that other students around the world could use if they want to. And I've had two students work on independent study projects in editing all of this, getting it, uh, making sure everything's correct, getting it all uploaded to the website. Um, so you'll see if you look at my page in the beginning here, there's a whole list of student authors and um, my editors, former student Elizabeth, and I have another student right now who's working interactive content for it. So. An example would be something she's working on. Here's a turtle skull, and it would be a situation where you can take um, words and drop them into identify structures um, that way. So in the end, you'll have the static images and then quizzes to go along with everything. So it turns out this is called open pedagogy, I believe. They're calling it um, when students are contributing to the, the the production of a resource like this. So, um, in terms of inclusion and inequity, really the thought was a way to give students some place some some place to study that wasn't needing to schlep into the lab every night to um, work with the actual specimens. And it hasn't been a big deal for our students because our students do have good access to the labs in our building and everything. Um, but I was really pleased when other institutions started picking it up and saying this is going to be great for us when we can't get to the lab um, to to be able to use it. And it's totally a work in progress. And I've invited the users to to 
if their students have some good pictures and things to co collaborate with us and contribute as well. So I think that's all I'll say for now and then um, take some questions later. And Kristen, I wanted to note that there's a comment in the chat from Reese Allen that says that is so cool. Oh, but I couldn't see the chat. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Nicole Wade. She is assistant professor in the Department of Secondary Education and Educational Technology at SUNY Oneonta, where she focuses on social studies education. With several other faculty authors from the education departments of SUNY Oneonta, she contributed to the writing of an original OER book called Foundations of Education, which she's going to describe for us today. So, Nicole. Thanks for moderating this. I'm glad that to keep a participant. Um, so what happened is our faculty had adopted a textbook in 2015, and at the time it seemed like the best thing out there. But as we started to grow and use the book and get more uh, acclimated to it, we found that it, we really had to change things a lot, a little bit too much to um, justify having students pay um, for a pretty expensive textbook. So what we did was we um, met with Ed. And it's like we got all the Ed Education 106 professors, which is the Foundation's Issues in Education course. We got together and we discussed what we might want to do in terms of um, making an open access textbook. So we got all the faculty together and we, we broke it down chapter um, by chapter. Each uh, faculty member was given a chapter. We would get together and we would meet um, and discuss where we're going with this chapter. And we would use Lumen Learning and we would find resources for our materials and we would peer edit all of our work. And now we have a pretty solid textbook that I'm happy to know that we have um, other institutions that have recently contacted us and they're interested in using our materials. And it is such a great feeling to know that as a junior faculty, that there are people in, it was, it was one of the Midwest uh, states, they're going to be um, wanting to adopt our textbook, which is only a, a bigger motivator for us to go in and make um, re revisions, which we were looking for in our old textbook. But it, like we were just um, buying their books. We didn't have a vested interest in it. We didn't, we didn't have a license to change all their materials. So we took it upon ourselves to meet on a regular basis and collaborate our way to a textbook that we were all pretty happy and proud of. Um, and the students, like I said, we're saving them a whole lot of money with opening um, the access. But in addition to the open, open access textbook, we also use other open resources. And the nice thing is we would, um, now we will have people attributing our work in, in their um, research and studies. And this is actually with the success of this book, it has even um, encouraged me to break out into a student created textbook for my social studies methods class, because I was asked to do a professional development on differentiated instruction and flipping the social studies classroom. Then the pandemic hit, it's like, well, this would be great for my class to create a resource for, um, all future classes um, to, sh to show them that students can create knowledge and it can be disseminated. I don't think that students really um, embrace a lot of them knowing that they could be a published author if they uh, embrace open, um, open um, educational resources. So it, it's been a, a springboard for um, from the Ed 106 project onto a differentiated instruction and flipping the social studies classroom project. And it's also going to impact my research on things that I feel that would be uh, of a more general interest, such as um, a family's um, journey with um, autism. So those are the things that we have going, I have going personally with OERs. So I did one and 
saw the value so much in it that I just wanted to incorporate it in all my classes or as many classes as I could. And I could uh, answer any questions at the end. I got to say it is really fun to get those emails when people are finding those resources that we're putting out and saying, yes, this is this is high quality and it's something I want to use. Um, we, we've heard from Morrisville is using our textbook right in the SUNY system. Open Oregon was reviewing it and even the, the Oregon was looking at it for their entire system um, to look at it as something to unify their education curriculum. It's been really interesting. Um, one of the things that sometimes gets levied against open access is how can these things be high quality because they're free? It's it's an unfair accusation, but it's something that a lot of us that are doing open access projects have to deal with a little bit. Um, and I think I'm going to put this question to Kristen because I know that you've done some work around this. Um, what have you done with your project to kind of get that review feel in there to make sure that um, what what you're doing has the stamp of approval of the academy that we're part of? So so choosing to do something like this open open access um, poses the risk that you do all this work and nobody recognizes it. I could have published it with a publisher and be recognized as scholarship that way. Um, what I did with this particular project is um, there is actually a good community in the life sciences where there's um, it's called the life science teaching resource community that I'm part of and I have been working with them um, for a little while um, a way to share things like this and get it peer reviewed so that um, it could be more highly recognized um, both by the outside world and hopefully by um, people reviewing my tenure and promotion packages as scholarship. Um, so I've worked through this community, then they send it out to professional associations um, and give you peer review. And so it's got a stamp of approval, my project from the Society of Deve Deve Developmental Biologists. Um, and so I consider that one way of, you know, a stamp of approval from the, the larger community. And, and just the fact that it's adopted, your work is adopted by other institutions, I think also, you know, speaks to the quality. Um, but it does take a lot of work to get stuff looking professional. Um, clear expectations for the students who are producing the work in the first place, and then close work with my students who work on editing it after the fact. Um, it didn't all look that good when we started, um, but, but careful work um, can get it looking pretty polished. You know, Nicole, I would ask you almost the same question. Um, I, I, I was watching this process from the sidelines of this education book um, being built. And actually part of my favorite part of the project was seeing the collaboration that your team had between there. And even not everything seemed to get into the book, but there was also just as robust of materials alongside of the book Google draw. Oh, what do you do for this topic? Let's slide that in there. Could you talk a little bit about how your team worked together and and what that collaboration was a little bit different when you were really taking control of that whole curriculum? Well, I think that we um, just almost set up a framework at first and I remember that we spent the first couple days going over trying to wrap our head, heads around what OERs were because a lot of us I'm, I'm assuming most of us on that um, committee that created the textbook wasn't um, had no exposure to OER. So as we started, we started to write one chapter all together, and we we just had this almost disjointed. It's funny how it just seemed like how is this going to come together? But then you know we problem solved, and we 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 would meet every Wednesday, every other Wednesday, and we'd get in the computer lab and we would just write and we'd bounce ideas off each other. And to, to speak to the point of not being like, like not rigorously peer reviewed, I believe there are, you could correct me, nine authors? Nine authors. Nine, nine authors. So every, um, every chapter was peer reviewed by eight other professors. 
And I think that speaks to why we are getting response um, and why having people interested in um, wanting to adopt the textbook. And I think that from my perspective anyway, it makes me want to take those additional resources and to make a really good supplemental um, resources or maybe like a test bank or like what works and what we've used that works. And one thing that was outside of the actual work group is we get together in, in education and we once a semester we're saying, OK, we did this and it really works really well. And I think that what we're going to be doing in our next steps um, are accumulating all this collective stuff that we're doing in our classes and putting it into the open so people can see what we do at SUNY Oneonta because we have a rather strong education program so they can see what we're doing in our classes. So I think that it had to be a collaborative effort because so many there were so many people who were teaching the course. And I think that um, we really gave some really robust uh, feedback to each other. So it, it, I, I feel it's of really high quality. And I don't think it would have been that way had we not been so hands-on with one each other in the um, collaboration process. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's a question in the chat, and I think I'm going to direct it to Greg first. Um, it's from Eileen Morgan Zaychek, and she says, what part of your projects do students or some students seem to find especially meaningful? And, and, and I would just add on to that, you know, is do you, was it what you had hoped for when you started off on? Did, were, were you surprised by what students are taking away? Um, <laughs> or, or was it exactly what you expected when you were going into it? Well, I knew that I wanted them to take control of the process, but I didn't really anticipate how much more committed they would be to it as a result of them feeling like it was their journal, you know, so I think the fact that they controlled, you know, the the review process, they controlled the editorial board, many of them came to meetings without getting any credit of any kind, you know, so it really did become this, you know, evidence that, you know, they were committed to this journal by them, you know, not getting anything in return. They just really were enjoying the process of, you know, promoting this journal and keeping it going. Uh, and most of them have since, you know, indicated or are currently looking to get into graduate school. You know, so <laughs> that was one of my hidden agendas, you know, like <laughs> I wanted to make the world of higher ed, higher education attractive to them, you know. I didn't really beat around the bush about that. I wanted this to be a socialization experience. And uh, I don't know, I think they really, they they really developed that, that identity, that scholarship identity, which I think is, there's research that says that's one of the best predictors of getting people to go to graduate school is to develop that, you know, and I couldn't think of any other way to do it. <clears throat> so I would say that, that seemed to be the most meaningful part to them, which is that change to their identity when they really started feeling like I can do this. I am a scholar. I can publish. I can review research. You know, it's not the mysterious privilege of people in ivory towers that I never see. <laughs> this is open to all of us. We can do this, you know, so that I think it was empowering for them, you know, in that respect. And it looks like you've got a follow up in the hmm. chat. Um, and I think this student happens to be in the biology department, says, how can we expand sort of different departments? Why is it only for social scientists? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've gotten questions uh, and we say, well, actually I've had environmental science before it was environmental studies. I had a student publish a paper there, so it is open to anybody to publish as long as the topic is somewhat social science. -y. But we have talked like we should have like different versions of SOAR with a subtitle, you know, like SOAR, the social science edition or SOAR, the biology edition. And I would love to to see it go in that direction. Honestly, we just need to have some students step up and uh, take that on because we probably have separate editorial boards and uh, build it out horizontally. But I think you know, we have everything in place. You know, it'd be a piece of cake to do that. So I'm definitely open to that if that's something that you want to make happen <laughs> so, let's so we'll put it we'll put it back on the questioner who i think is a senior yeah knowledge is if you want to be editor-in-chief of the science section of Got the it. of the uh of the sore then then that's up to you um let's let's go to nikki next 
And uh, let's ask that same question um, from Eileen Morgan Zajacek. Uh, what did your students seem to find especially meaningful? I think that they appreciated that I felt that they were up to the challenge of being scholars. I think that in social studies education, we really don't like, encourage our kids to publish as much as we um, should, um, because it's just uh, teaching is a very reflective profession um, and they could do reflective research. They could do action research. But what they found is that they just felt like they were given a seat at the table to extend their learning. And I, I had approached the class and said that I was planning to, to put a workbook together for differentiated instruction, especially in social studies. But in the high school, we don't um, see as much flipped. Well, we didn't before the pandemic. Um, so they were very motivated. They would take feedback on their work and they would just want to make it the best we could make it. So I think it was a great big confidence builder for them, especially when they were getting ready to go into their student teaching, that they knew that the work that they were going to be complaining would eventually be read by other people and my future method students. And I think that they just felt that they were going to be linked with each other forever because of their work on that one book. It was a quite special um, experience for them. Kristen, can we ask you the same question? The question is, what did they what did they find meaningful about it? Um, uh, so I think I saw the. The most fun part of it, this was the second year that I did this project and it's um, I, I feel like our students a lot of times need to rem be reminded that the work we assign for them is not for us as instructors. Most of the time it's for their own benefit, but I think it, it was a lot of fun the second year when the Atlas was already there and halfway finished and they could look at it and see the work that I'm producing is going to contribute to this thing that other people around the world can look at. And so they really wanted to do a nice job. And I, I it was more fun to watch them do the project the second time around when they could see that this was a, a helpful thing for other people out there. And that it's not just me assessing them on something for the sake of assessing them on something. Thank you so much. We have a question from uh, Michelle Hendley and it's for Greg. What platforms are you using for submissions to the journal. Yeah, we have a link uh, on our website that's essentially just an email. We do have, and we thank the college for supporting us uh, because we have a sponsored account. Uh, it's soar at oneana.edu, which is really easy to remember. So they just email, and like I said, we wanted it to be a more personal experience. So instead of getting some auto generated message, thank you, fill in the blank author. Uh, for your interest. No, we we tailor it. We say, what are you trying to publish here? You know, so we reach out to them through email. We just check our email every week and uh, we receive submissions that way as well. If you ever want to kick the tires on the open source public knowledge projects, different journal publishing mechanisms, which is one of the ways that um, a lot of open access journals are published. They use the same open source. Um, that's the kind of thing that makes me really nerdy and really excited. Um, unrelated to the current yeah. panel. Um, <laughs> Eric Stegler has a question um, and he says, could anyone comment on the pressures from publishers in resistance to open scholarship and how we need to respond in higher ed? or how higher ed is responding. Um, and I'll just leave that as an open question to any of the panelists. I think that one of the things that we have to talk about, and we have to talk about it quite frankly, is that um, Publishing isn't free. It isn't always no overhead to publish, but we have to be very honest and say the current publishers have abused this system where faculty authors work for free and they're making 30% revenue off of 
free labor that the that the faculties of the universities and colleges across the country are doing and that open scholarship is a great equalizer here because it's forcing the conversation with the big players in this market like Elsevier. Elsevier controls such a big part of the open access market, uh, or I'm sorry, of the for-profit journal market, um, and they 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 charge us exorbitant rates. And meanwhile, our faculty have to participate in the publishing landscape to keep their own jobs, and they do it for free. And they serve on the editorial boards, and they do it for free. And then we have a for-profit company making a higher margin than Apple does, than Walmart does, than Google does. Their profits are more than some of these than some of these companies that we sometimes think of as the big evil company, and that needs to be talked about. The flip side of that is there are professional societies that keep going based on their annual conferences, based on their journals, and are using the subscription fees um, for things that are needed. And these are th what's happening right now is. It, we're, we're being forced to talk about this in the open um, is where our money is going and what should it be going to do. Um, I really like this question and if it's OK, I'd like to contribute a bit to addressing it. And I really appreciate what you've just said, Ed, and would only add that there is a role for the institution to play and, and maybe it's um, going to be most effective if an institution can speak with a single voice or work uh, at a single purpose in negotiations with publishers. Uh, a single academic library in negotiating with publishers is in a relatively weak position, but um, a consortium or group of academic libraries or institutions working together is in a much stronger position. And we've seen this uh, happen successfully, this sort of collective work in um, negotiating with publishers uh, achieve more successes uh, than when single institutions uh, are seeking to negotiate with publishers. And yet we must always negotiate with publishers. And I think it's probably most healthy if we can um, treat them as partners um, to the extent that we can treat them as partners and, and certainly act in good faith and, and count on their good faith activity uh, as, as far as that reaches. Uh, but also be prepared to uh, to deal with, as uh, as Ed mentioned, the Elseviers, and be able to come up with a smart strategy in response to that. And you know, the point you're making about the position faculty are in as both the content creators and um, and editors uh, and other you know expert labor that contributes to the excellent content that then the journals uh, and publishers are selling back to the institutions. Uh, leaves them in, in, a, in a role where publishers typically don't want to upset the balance there and don't want to upset faculty. So they would seek to uh, lay all of their aggressive you know, action and pressure on um, the institution or, or the library in negotiating for contracts. And, and that's not faculty who are really experiencing that, which is appropriate, and we wouldn't want faculty to experience that um, pressure from uh, publishers in any way. But it is important that faculty and students are aware of the, the structure of it and the system that Ed just described. And so part of our job is to do those in the libraries to perform those negotiations or contribute to uh, collective negotiation and work with um, uh, publishers and also to uh, support our campus community by making them aware of this structure and how through open access, our practice and our work, what we're talking about today can be so powerful and so effective and can have, you know, myriad benefits. Can I, can I chime in? Because I did, this conversation reminded me, we did actually reach out to Elsevier because we wanted to be indexed. We said, we want people to be able to discover our articles and they turned us down. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like Google is currently facing an antitrust lawsuit because they control the discovery of material on the web. What happens when Elsevier just controls the discovery of scholarly materials? And some people are kept out of that loop, right? Including And that's a great time to that's a great time to plug the SUNY open access repository that's created because we can 
place the articles that are created and publish them. And because we place them in SUNY's um, open access repository that we're sharing with the other 64 campuses, now we can have that that mass that people will index it and search it and pull that information into theirs and make all of our work more visible. So again, like Darren said, working as a consortia, um, we can have more um, more imprint and a bigger footprint. And you know, I, I'm going to embarrass somebody um, on the call who's not a presenter. I, know, I see Eric Stengler's here, and what reminds me of this is Kathy Meeker is putting in the chat every couple of minutes. This would make a really good Life of the Mind presentation. And I remember at Life of the Mind last year, the great student presentation that his students brought about the lessons that they were creating um, in science education and how similar a project it is to what Nikki Wade is doing with her students with the differentiated instruction and students creating those lessons and sharing them out. And continuing to talk about these interesting projects that we're doing in spaces like this can lead to some synergies that maybe we need to have a repository of differentiated lessons. Cause I know that's part of both of yours instructions that then all of our students can point to and say, you want to hire a SUNY Oneana grad because look at the work we do. And by the way, there's my work in our repository. Yes, and I remember our conversation that started back then and life of the mind of last year. And we definitely need to, you know, take that up and make it happen. So we we're getting back in touch soon. Yeah, now we're three because it was going to be just the two of us, but now now we have to bring in um, we, now we have to bring in Dr. Wade and uh, I'm sure that it's not just her. I'm sure there's a lot more that we can bring in and have that same conversation. What is the education version of SOAR? And it and it and it and it comes into where we're talking about this um, like Dr. Rosa was talking about where she has a community that she corresponds with that's all about teaching anatomy and physiology at the college level and how do we have these conversations and share um, and put structure around it. I wanted to uh, bring up a comment from Jean-Paul Ojan in the library uh, to Greg's point that he made earlier about students paying for articles. He says to Greg's point, there's also the so socialization involved in using library resources effectively. It's unfortunate to hear that our students may not be aware of services such as interlibrary loan. The library has an instruction program and welcomes any class for course specific instruction. Um, and I guess that leads to one of the questions that I had um, for the panelists, which is getting into open access publishing or creating or adapting um, OER books is not an automatic process that you go through as a faculty member. So where do you go for um, resources, for help, uh, we've heard Nicole talk about going to ed, but where else? Like, how did you guys get started and where do you go for ideas and resources about this? You can all answer ed, that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know Ed has helped me as an instructor. Uh, you know, he's helped me out. Uh, finding OER textbooks and so forth, which as chair of the department, now we're living in a virtual world. I've handed off a complete shell with a built in textbook, which a lot of my student, a lot of my faculty thank me for. <laughs> it's like, you know, so you're getting the full package there. The course is ready to run, you know, with the textbook right in the shell. You know, you can't beat that. <clears throat> uh, so, but I have honestly, I've Googled I did find another one just by Googling. I found the University of Minnesota had a great social problems sociology textbook. So, you know, I guess I'm as guilty as my students with using Google for these things. <laughs> but we often start there, don't we? Uh, but I, I could definitely use, you know, I did actually look at Lumen's site, but I didn't find anything. Uh, Can we invite anybody to say any final words? Our, we have our three panelists and it is right about four o'clock, but Chris, is there anything else you would like to add to this conversation? Something you wish you got to say? I was thinking more about the what what we do about the problem of big publishers and my experience recently publishing in a few open access journals and it's it's faculty choice is a big part of this. I could have published my stuff in other journals and 
chose not to. Um, chose to publish in things that are undergraduate focus, teaching focus. And part of that choice was publishing in journals that don't have copy editing staff or any paid staff at all. And so even more work is put on us as authors to format things incredibly meticulously, which I didn't realize. Um, but to me, it was worth it. The extra work in formatting down to how many spaces are between everything and things that copy editors would take care of at a, a paid journal. Um, to me, it was worth it. You know, I spent an extra half a day formatting this so that the editors of the journal could just quickly publish it online and it's not an extra burden for them. And so for the purpose of getting it out there freely, um, you, you take on extra stuff like that. But if it's a conscious choice that you're making to make this more normal among uh, people like us at a teaching undergraduate research focused institution, it's, it's worth it to me. Thank you, Kristen. Nikki, anything you want to say before we sign off? I think you're still on mute. Yeah, I'm on mute. Uh, I just think that sometimes we, we work um, harder and not smarter, but I think that with open, open um, educational resources and open pedagogy, we have, we're taking the limited resources that we have and our students have, and we're opening it up to so many different resources. And if if you, any of you are not using OERs, I really recommend it because it. I tell my students, I train rock stars. If they want to be in the chorus, they can be in the chorus, but I train rock stars. And I think that giving them the confidence to create their own um, resources is what I want to do as a professor. And the kids are responding really well to it. Thank you, Nikki. Greg, you get the final word, I think. I, I feel guilty taking the final word. I've said a lot. But uh, yeah, I, I, I just appreciate this whole session. And, you know, like I said, it was my goal to socialize students into this whole world from the get go so that that became the normal instead of the other way around, which is the way it usually works out. So if they do go into higher ed, they're going into it with this background and then when they see the paywalls, they're going to go, what the heck? <laughs> what is this about? Why do we do this? You know, or as authors, you know, why am I being exploited in this way? You know, this is not really fair. So yeah, I, I hope the socialization, they take it with them. You know, that's that's my goal. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure being here. I'm sorry we didn't get my student here, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure she'll speak at a future time. Thank you, everyone. We'll stay on for a few minutes after if anyone has follow up questions. Thanks yeah. for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. The panelists and the moderators. Thank you. I forgot to mention I had another student who actually oh, called yeah. Google. He called Google and said, when we search things on Google, our website doesn't come up. You know, is there any way we can change that? And they did. I said, what? I've never heard of anything like that. You called Google. First of all, that sounds like something my dad would do, not a student. <laughs> right. Jonathan Sanchez, very successful student. Well, you know, Google algorithms aren't as complex as you know we give them credit for and so it's interesting as these we build we're building these new websites and they're building up how many clicks they're getting and how much attention they're getting it's really interesting to see it start to rise to the top um i know like the the comparative anatomy atlas started off really low it was hard to find i think now when you say you when you um google comparative anatomy it's right there as the top link Hmm. Yes, uh, Google yourself once a day for a little while and it'll bring it up the list. <laughs> That's how I got mine up there and then I haven't done it in a while. But other other places have been looking for stuff and so that's how another way to get it up there on the list. And then we're we're working right now to all these creation projects that people are doing. Um, Jen is doing some great work putting them into 
um, the DSpace repository. So we, we, SUNY now has two repositories. We have one for scholarship and one for educational materials. And she's starting to put the ones for education materials up so that they'll be even more findable. Because um, now it's not just a Google search, but it's indexed, it's appropriately metadata, um, mm -hmm. and that will help bring it to the top. I would love it if all of our gen eds had OER texts, you know, because those tend to be more intro level and there tends to be more options in the OER world for intro level books. Some of the more specialized courses I teach, there just aren't really very many options because it's a niche, you know. But I guess I'll have to write a book and then just give it to them. <laughs> we we need to write a grant and get you funded. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> give it to them. That's 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 the better answer. <laughs> yeah, I like that answer. I, you know, it, it, when, in all of this, our hope is not, you know, or at least my hope is not to create another exploitive system. It's to get the creators the 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 uh, money for doing the work um, and to make sure that it becomes in a cycle of continuous 